In 1952, the national champion, he outplayed 500 contestants uh, in New York City, uh, sponsored by the uh, American Accordionist Association. Ah, now we're getting to it. He's an accordionist, huh? That's right. And you know what you mean? People sat and listened to 500 of those things in one day? That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and apparently they were quite impressed with him because he again had the distinction of being the first person awarded a scholarship by the American Accordionist Association. Good, good, good. Well, I don't know what kind of a scholarship we can give him here, but we'll introduce him to some of the people in show business who matter, mm -hmm. and if he's got it, he'll go on. Let's see what he does, huh? Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Parente. Wait a minute, let him come out first. All right. Here he is, your discovery into the Lipton spotlight, Joseph Soprani. <laughs> And uh, sometimes I can practice four or five hours a day preparing for a concert. Uh, when I played with the uh, uh, Immaculata and uh, Newman College orchestras and the uh, Lansdowne Symphony, I was practicing many, many hours. And as I get older, it's a little tough to move the fingers the way they used to. So I have to compensate, you know, put in a little more time. These books represent all my activities from the very beginning of, uh, I would say, uh, of the f 1950 and it goes all the way to 19, uh, 2013. Okay, uh, 1957, I was in the Air Force Band, so it says Officers Club Bowling, party for General LeMay, and he was uh, uh, the big uh, four-star general of the Air Force. I did uh, Westgate, Watergate rather, Water Watergate uh, with Congressman Kearns, he conducted, and then I did uh, Capital Steps every year with the uh, United States Air Force Band. I'm a late night practicer. Yeah, that's when I get all my energy. I feel that the world has quieted down. Now I can chip in and do what I have to. I can't sit and watch television too long. Uh, my wife will tell you. I sit down for five minutes and I'm upstairs doing something or I might be on the computer doing some arranging on the accordion, doing some practice, and I'll go down again, watch another program, then come back up back and forth, back and forth. Uh, my energy seems to be in the creativity of, of, of the music end of it. At age five, Joe's family presented him with an accordion. He immediately took to the instrument, learning as much as he could by taking lessons with a friend of the family. However, Joe's grandfather, an opera composer who would play and sing tunes for Joe to transcribe at a very young age, saw that his grandson was being held back. So at age 10, Joe began studying at the Pietro Dero Accordion School, which set the stage for his talent to be cultivated and subsequently discovered. At age 11, I was uh, on the uh, Jack Steck Starlet Stairway, and I was with him. In fact, I used to have what we call a Paisani, he used to come to my house. He was a member of the Lions Club, and he would always take me to his meetings to play. So at one of the meetings, the accompanist there was the accompanist uh, who was uh, on the, the uh, Jack Steck program. So she finally wrote a note. She said, take this to Jack Steck. And I did, and I was on his show for about a couple of years. Then from that show, I went with the Children's Hour, which was the Horn and Harder Children's Hour. Stanley Broza, everybody in, in, in my era knows that show. And I stayed there for six years. So Rosalie Parente was my talent scout for the Godfrey Show. From the Godfrey Show, I got a call from the USO out of New York. He wanted me to headline a Broadway Ballyhoo who was, that was starting in the fall. I got into the USO show. Uh, I, I think I had performed with the Philadelphia Orchestra just around the, the same time. And uh, from there, that, that was the, you know, the catalyst uh, of my career. This is very special to me. This is what they call the Air Force Roger. And uh, this is what I won in 1955. I was a winner of the instrumental solo 
when I represented the United States Air Force Band worldwide, and I'm very proud of this. I had three auditions before I got to the main one with Ormandy. And before that, uh, I was before Lauren Monroe, who was the cellist, uh, uh, David Madison, who was the first violinist, and uh, Teresa Costello, who was the harpist. So I'm in the room, and I played the Mendelssohn, third movement of the Mendelssohn Concerto. <laughs> I'm looking at them, and they're looking at each other. Is it, is, am I here, are we hearing things? Is, is, this kid's playing the, flag, the, the Mendelssohn Concerto. So I, I, at first I thought, oh my God, they're reacting negatively, but it was the, the opposite. They liked it so much that I went into the second, second audition, and the third audition was at the academy, and I didn't think I had a shot. So I said, I don't have a chance. I told Rosa Parenti, said, oh, this competition is too fierce. It was Anna Maffa, and I'm packing up. I'm, I'm walking out the door. She says, where are you going? I said, I don't think I have a chance. <laughs> she says, I won't be too sure about that. I think you should come back in. So I did, and my name was called, and I just fell off the chair. Here I am, pictures with Ormandy, Anna Maffa, Quesada, Enrico Serratis and myself when I appeared with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And that was the most exciting performance of my life. As a kid, I always wanted to appear with a, a symphony orchestra. I never knew it would be the Philadelphia Orchestra. We had just started to um, consider using backstage bandas again for a while because of budget constraints. Everything had been without a banda, backstage orchestra. And I didn't have enough money for 20 people. We were doing Traviata. And the conductor, Maurizio Barbacini, and I were talking and thought, you know, maybe we could do an interesting combination. And it was actually Maestro Barbacini who came up with the idea of an accordion. And the only accordion in Philadelphia was Joe, in terms of somebody with great quality who knew that he would be wonderful. And so we were fortunate enough that he agreed to come do this. And it was, it was kind of, uh, it was different because you wouldn't necessarily expect that. However, in Traviata, the backstage banda is, is always about party music and what better than an accordion to keep everything together. So to have a great musician like Joe, play the accordion, you didn't know it was possible to get some of those um, you know, exquisite sounds and the velocity and just the, the musical accuracy. You know, and every time I see him, if he has his instrument, and I know he really doesn't want to do it. And I think, I, I'm not sure, on Arthur Godfrey, I think he played Lover. Everybody played Lady of Spain, so I know he didn't play. I guess it was lower. And last time I worked with him, I said, "Come on, just just give me the first four or five bars." Uh, you know, they said we're going. I mean, I just that just brings back so many memories. remember I contracted an orchestra for Pavarotti when he appeared here in, oh, I don't know, 93, and they needed an accordion, so, I mean, who else do you call? So I think I've played with him about five times, and I was ready to go on his last world tour when, you know, he passed away, and that was, that was a sad, uh, sad day for, uh, for everyone. And he was a great art, a great performer. What, what stage presence on stage? He, he just had the audience in his hand. Uh, I knew of Joe Soprani, and I was doing a record with an artist named uh, Billy Falcon. And it was a, a very cool, organic record. So I won an accordionist on one of the songs. I had him come in to the studio, and it was you know, he's a great player. So I asked him to play a very simple part. He came in, no ego, played the part great, understood the place of his instrument in the record, what I was looking for. We knocked it out in like 20 minutes. And it was fun, he was a fun guy to work with. So then, Bon Jovi was going on tour, I guess, 96. And the production was absolutely amazing when you looked at the stage and what we had. So I wanted something grandiose to uh, start the show with. And, and John had decided, that no matter where we went, he was going to have a like a marching band, a local 
marching band. I mean, when, when we were in Bavaria, it was like a umpa band. But we were gonna, it was gonna be, no matter where we were, we were gonna get a flavor of where we were. So I asked Joe to do an arrangement of Lay Your Hands On Me. And, and he did it, and he said, listen, why don't you come in and have my kids play on it? So I went in and he got his marching band in the band room, and I went in and recorded it, and then put some other studio guys on it, some horn players. And when you, when the Bon Jovi show would start, it would be this huge thing of this marching band, the drums and the trumpets doing Lay Your Hands On Me. It was great. It was crazy. Yo, Joe Soprani, do you know El Solomillo? Sure, Russ, I got it right here. Well, let's do this thing then, baby, come on. Take it away. Working with Bon Jovi and appearing with Russell Watson on Good Morning America only begins to scratch the surface on some of Joe's high-profile appearances. Over the course of his storied career, Joe has performed on The Ed Sullivan Show, at the White House for President Eisenhower, for the heads of state of Morocco, Cambodia, and Japan, and as a guest of Peter Nero and the Philly Pops. Doing the, the, the Phillies um, at the, uh, the, the, the Philly Fanatic at uh, the park, that, that was really neat. And all the things I've done in all my career, that was the most uh, popular and that got more response than anything I've ever done. Military audiences are the best, and I always entertain the troops. And this was the big one, and to be, you know, to f to have your name as the the leader of the USO shows, boy, oh boy, that was great. And we had a, a magician, we had a dancing family, mother, father, sister, brother, and they were famous. They were on Steel Pier, uh, Hammond's Pier, and all over the country. Ed Sullivan show, and we had a magician. And uh, Joe Wong was our comedian. And uh, we had a terrific show. It was great. Uh, it was supposed to be to uh, uh, Japan, Korea, Pacific Islands. But we never made the Pacific Islands because of the crash. Well, we were going from Miho to uh, another town, uh, Iwakuni. And it was only an hour away. And it was, you know, standard procedure. We were worried about it. And it was on Thanksgiving Day. We had just finished the Thanksgiving meal. And we were asked to board a C-47. Well, we got onto the plane. And there was mechanical problems with this particular plane. So we had to wait. Got another one, which happened to be the C-46. Now, as I'm told the story afterwards, it was the C-46 that really saved our lives. And the reason was that the C-46 and the C-47 are so similar, but the C-46 had a, a compartment underneath that acted as a, a boy, and it was able to stay up just five minutes. If we were on the 47, it did not have the cargo underneath, it would have gone right down as soon as we hit the water. And I'm sitting across from our comedian and we, we made the sign of the cross, and we said, see you, Joe. We, we were both Joes. It was see, almost at the same time, see you, Joe. And we hit so hard, we were going 140 miles an hour. And when I got out of the plane, we didn't know what it was, and then we realized it was water. And the plane was slowly going down, and we're the last three, the manager, the trumpet player, and myself, we're, we're standing on the wings. and. Uh, as the plane was going down, everybody was hollering to us, jump off, get off the plane, it's sinking. So we finally did. And uh, because, you know, if you're, you're close to the, the plane, you'll get sucked under with it. And it was a problem with one of the, the life jackets, the life rafts that was, it was stuck to the back of the plane. And for some reason, you know, somebody, you get the strength that you don't know you have. They were able to loosen the life raft from the plane. Here we were, the plane was gone. 
that was, we didn't see it anymore. I'm floating away, half my May West wasn't working. So one of the guys had to come back to me and grab me. And we had no idea. Now, after we hit the water, now we were starting to get panicky. We were starting to get a reaction. And, and all of a sudden we see lights coming from a distance. And what it was was a rescue boat, one rescue boat for 30 people. And it's, it's obvious that 30 people were not gonna fit on this boat. I was holding on the edge. We had about 15 people just holding on to the rope as we were being tugged in. And uh, it was November 26, 1953, and the water must have been below freezing. And it, uh, our bodies were just going back and forth. Our, our teeth, I mean, our, our mouths were just shaking, were shivering. And it was, it was terrible. It was, I, I never, you know, I have flashbacks every year. Nobody wanted to fly after that. We all took a boat and train. I had a three-day train from California to Washington, to Philadelphia, and uh, I was greeted uh, in, in the arms of my family. And it, it was a very emotional thing at the time. And uh, it, it grips me sometimes even talking about it now. I never got the hang of the accordion. I could never understand. The buttons are very confusing. The keyboard is very small. The keys are skinny. And you have to play it this way instead of that way. So it's fascinating to me that anybody could play it. Play the accordion? Really? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. The old joke about an accordion player that uh, stopped after a gig and uh, had his accordion in the back seat, stopped at a diner to eat, and when he came out, somebody broke in his car and there were three more accordions in the back. The old joke is, what's the difference between an accordion and a trampoline? And the answer is, you take your shoes off to jump on a trampoline. Uh, somebody, somebody sent me a... Uh, an email about uh, North Korea having four uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. You looked on the table and there were four accordions. <laughs> the accordion, no other instrument has had such a dramatic creation story, rise to popularity and dramatic fall from popularity. Uh, the accordion began very early in the 19th century when an Austrian inventor, Cyril Damien, wanted to provide the masses with an instrument that could be played at picnics and parties. This is what he wrote in his patent. He had to qualify it somewhat because he knew that the classical music elite would immediately reject it as being lowbrow. So here is one of the earliest accordions. This is not an actual Demian, but one of the many copies that circulated Europe. They were knocked off everywhere from Austria to Russia to um, East, East Europe, to Northern Europe. This is a 10 key early accordion, beautiful mother of pearl keys and nice, uh, um, nice ornamentation on the side. It's really hardly bigger than a big harmonica, is it? But it immediately caught on with um, regular folk who needed music to power social dancing. The accordion began to replace other instruments that were heavy and inconvenient, like the string bass or the bagpipes. And tens and thousands of them were produced in Europe in the 19th century okay, and became part of what we know as polka music, uh, Tejano and Conjunto music. They were brought by Germans and Czech immigrants, farmers to Texas and uh, melded with the local folk music to become Tejano, Norteño, Flaco Jimenez, of course, is part of that tradition. Um, the accordion spread everywhere because of its portability, its reasonable price, its affordability, and because it could overpower the sound of dancing feet on a wooden floor. <laughs> The 
story of the immigration to the, of, of European immigration to the U.S. in the 19th century and early 20th century it really would not be complete without the stories of musicians who brought accordions to popularize their music and also uh, jump on the big band and popular music bandwagon, incorporating accordions into society band music, even into jazz. These early immigrants like Pietro Dero and his brother Guido Dero uh, made the accordion marketable in the United States. By how? By setting up huge studios with whole flocks of teachers and disciples. He had a big studio in Manhattan and offshoots in New Jersey and Connecticut and the entire metro area. So the uh, early immigrants, uh, accordion playing geniuses, they were, but they were also marketing geniuses. Uh, also really important to the accordion's rise to popularity and acceptability in the United States was vaudeville. Yeah. The vaudeville, what was the vaudeville stage about? It was about animal acts, about changing the scene every 12 minutes, providing your audience with something racy, with something fun, with something really out there. And in the 19-teens and 1920s, the accordion could fall into the category of vaudeville entertainment because it was such a novelty instrument. Okay, uh, behind me I have some examples of the types of accordions that were made for vaudeville performers with the rhinestone inlays, some of them have rhinestones, they're, they're meant to catch the light on the vaudeville stage. And accordion performers were not circus acts, I mean they were as serious as vaudeville could get. They would get out there and they would play opera, they would play arias, classical music transcriptions as well as Italian po you know, polka and local folk music. Uh, Guido Dero was our first vaudeville star who brought the accordion to the masses. People would come up to him after the show and they said, how can I learn that? Where can I get one? He'd set up a studio overnight. Well, I started, when I came out of the service, I started with New Power Conservatory. And within two years, I was the assistant director and almost ran the whole program until the accordion was starting to make a, a nosedive. There was no interest in accordion. Only a couple places around the country that really stayed with it. But I couldn't afford to stay with it any longer because I had to raise a family. In the early 1960s, a couple of drastic things happened. One, of course, the Beatles' arrival to these shores, which um, suddenly changed the, um, you know, the musical lust object from accordion to guitar among American adolescents, okay. Uh, the accordion started just sort of looking out of place in the streamlined rock band. It, although many, many people here would passionately argue that the accordion is great for rock because it can play chords, it can play rhythm, the buttons give you, deliver a lot of punchy bass sound. Uh, the, 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 it had an image problem, okay. And that was not only because of the physical look and sound of the accordion itself, but because of its ethnic connotations. It was no longer cool to like play your parents' folk music. Devastating. When I had to give up the position that I had at the conservatory and start all over. I was out of a job for a year. I was playing at the Jefferson House. I was doing dinner music, cocktail hour, you know. This is not, this is not who I was, but I had to make a living. I taught, I always taught, I always had students. And uh, it, it was very hard for me to accept. But I think the, salvage, the, the salvation that I had, I brought the instrument to school. Joe was forced to reinvent himself. As the accordion fell out of fashion and with the added pressure of having to support a family, Joe turned to public school teaching to make a living. Proceeding with great reluctance and uncertainty about his new career, Joe began student teaching at Northeast High School. He quickly fell in love with the system, and not only did he enjoy teaching, he thrived. Joe was offered a job at Turner Middle School, and within just two weeks had formed a 40-piece orchestra. His seemingly endless energy, enthusiasm, and resourcefulness was quickly noticed, and Joe was tapped to pioneer a new music program in Lamberton High School, a position he would hold for 20 years. Throughout his tenure, Joe used the accordion in the classroom as a teaching tool, always incorporating his instrument in the most relevant way, while also enriching the learning experience for his students. Now, let me see you do the five, remember the five finger exercise, like you do on the piano. 
I have a couple of youngsters now that are, are playing accordion, and they love it. So something's going on out there. Go on the internet, look up accordions. I mean, there's, I mean, it's coming back. You called it a, a renaissance of of sort. <laughs> Um, the internet has created, you know, very serious accordion-loving communities in all the ethnic and regional styles. A guy who used the accordion all the time was Brian Wilson on the song, Wouldn't It Be Nice? A lot of accordion, and they're playing that triplet feel, da, 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 you know, it, it's amazing. And then the breakdown before the, the chorus vamp out, everybody else thought it was a uh, violin doing the tremolo. It's a, a bellows shake. It's too accordionist. And you know, you don't realize that in with all the other instruments, but you know, the Beatles used accordion, Delamitri, Springsteen on a lot of records. So, you know, it's got a great history in, in contemporary pop music. You know, it's a cool instrument. It's a whole different ball game. They're still out there. It's great. But we, we've we've come past the 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 variation of all the shake and, and that kind of thing. Trend or no trend, Joe has never wavered from the instrument, always seeing the beauty and expressive qualities within the bellows. Joe's dedication to the accordion for the majority of his 80 years has taken him all over the world and given him some of the most unique performance experiences imaginable. Throughout all of this, he continues to work on his craft, constantly perfecting his approach to an instrument that gets little respect, yet delivers a sound unlike any other, especially the way that Joe plays it.